kind of gloomy outside, but inside here, it's the joy of the Lord. And it's such a great day to come and worship Him, isn't it? Yeah. Praise God for all the blessings. We can worship in a warm house. Isn't that great? Yeah. It's really nice that we don't have to stoke the fire with coal or wood. It's all automatic. It's pretty good. My house, I have to keep putting wood in the fire. I have to carry the ashes out. But here, the Lord has really blessed us. Praise God for that. I'd like to begin today uh, with this message by prayer. Will you join me, please? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your love and your blessings today as we listen to your word being spoken. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be here to lodge those truths into our hearts and that we could become more like Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Be ye holy even as I am holy. And what does it mean to be holy? What does that really mean? I want to look in Leviticus chapter 11. And in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44, uh, it says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. And neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bring you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, and you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And so in Leviticus chapter 11, uh, we see there this ideal that God presents to the, 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 the children of Israel there, that there are certain clean and unclean animals, and they could eat the clean but could not eat the unclean. They needed to abstain from that. And so for them to be holy, it meant that they had to uh, be obedient to what God was telling them and to abstain from the unclean animals. Also, he is reminding them that they should not uh, do anything that would defile them with the creeping things of the earth uh, by eating those things that uh, are not clean. Also, in Leviticus chapter 19, in verse number 2, In Leviticus 19, you'll look in this chapter, you'll see here in Leviticus 19, 16 times the Lord says, I am the Lord. He reminds them over and over and over again that those things that he has created are not the Lord. And no matter how hard they try to fashion something to make it look like what their idea of God is like, he's reminding them, I'm the Lord. And all of those things are not what uh, I'm about. And so you see in this chapter here, he reminds them over. Like the Sabbath is something that we keep, and it is because God commands us to do that. And he says that is part of us being holy before God, is remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He goes on to say that, in, like in verse 15, uh, you shall do no un unrighteousness and judgment. Thou shalt not respect the, poor, the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. And thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer or a gossip among thy people. By in doing that, by becoming a talebearer, a gossip, we lose that stature of holiness. Does that make sense? We defile ourselves. You know what defile means? That means to be morally unfit. That means that we being morally unfit are not worthy to come into the presence of God and worship him. We're defiled. And so that's what the Old Testament teaches, that this defilement needs to be dealt with before the children of Israel can walk into the presence of a holy God. And so God is reminding them over and over, I am the Lord. And it says there that in verse number 17, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. That's another issue. Sometimes people have these grudges, like it talks about in verse 18 that uh, they want to avenge themselves because they've been hurt in some way or been slighted and they bear these grudges against other people in their heart. That's not the holiness of the Lord that does that. And so God is reminding the children of Israel and you and I today that when we do those things, we're not living up to the holiness that God expects of each one of us. In this whole chapter, God is reminding the children of Israel, this is how you become holy. I'm holy, and I want you to be that way too. God is holy, and he wants us to have that same kind of holiness in our life. And in uh, chapter 20, at verse number 7, you see again where God is saying, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I, the Lord your, because I am the Lord your God. And 
this holiness, this sanctified, means to be ceremonially or morally cleansed and dedicated to God. And when the children of Israel were uh, defiled with something that they had done or some dead animal that they had touched or been in the room with a dead body, they had to do some ceremonial cleansing so that they, they, it would take away the symbolic defilement that they had. And they had to go through certain rituals to be able to cleanse themselves from that. You look in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 15, um, we see here uh, that God is also using Peter to talk about holiness from the New Testament experience. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, it says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. In other words, the words that we speak to each other and to other people, they need to be this flavor of holiness of God in the way we communicate with one another. Isn't that true? Even after you've been married 50 years, it's a little easy sometimes to say things that aren't quite as holy as they should be. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we get used to each other and we say things in our families that maybe we wouldn't say to other people. And we just really want to remember that God expects us to be holy all the time. And in verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. This is going back to what we had already read in Leviticus. Uh, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So God is talking about us being holy. Uh, and he, Peter is again going through verse 17 about the respect of persons and judgment. Um, he's talking about how we need to make sure that we are following after God and striving for that holiness that God calls us to in all the time that we're sojourning or living here on this earth. And um, I believe that God wants us to be holy. In fact, in verse 18, it says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, and as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And this was foreordained for us from the beginning of the world, that God would give his son to die for each one of us so that you and I could have holiness. Isn't that great? Yeah, it's through the shed blood of Jesus, friends, that you and I have this opportunity to be holy. It is from Jesus. We don't have it within us. In fact, in uh, Isaiah chapter 65, it tells us there that our holiness, our righteousness is like filthy rags. We've heard that many times from the pulpit. We've read it in our studies. Um, we don't have that kind of holiness inside of us. But the key, the key is this, that when we invite Jesus to come into our heart, guess what he brings with him? His holiness. That's right. And so that makes us holy when we have Jesus living in us. Isn't that correct? We're not born with holiness. God gives us to us through his son, Jesus. And holiness, uh, if you look in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, and beginning in verse 1, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all the malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also, it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And peculiar does not mean some kind of a strange wacko, okay? What it's talking about, you're different than the rest of the world, right? You have Jesus Christ living in you. You're representing his, his holiness. And so that means that we're not some kind of a crazy person walking around. We're peculiar because we're different from what the world teaches and lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
which in time past you were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Praise God. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. And verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Some people think that because we're Christians, we no longer have to honor uh, the authorities around us. We cannot be lawbreakers and be good Christians. Does that make sense? You see, good Christians make good citizens. And God is calling for us to obey the laws of the land as long as they do not ask us to do something against the laws of God. There is coming a time when we're going to be forced to do something that is a, a contrary to the law of God. There will be laws passed where we cannot worship on Sabbath. And there will be, God's people will be forced or try to be forced. Laws will be enacted to make people worship on Sunday. There is a conflict between the laws of the land and the laws of God. And whenever there is a conflict, you and I have an obligation to the higher calling, and that is a calling to God our Father. And we must follow him. Even if it costs our life, no matter how, kind, how much we have to sacrifice, we must make God first over everything else. In verse 25, it says this, For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Praise God for that. Yeah, we have Jesus working in our hearts. Well, holiness, I, I looked up that word in the uh, concordance, it's hagios. It's the same word that's used for the sanctuary, the holy place. Hagio Hagion is for the most holy place. Well, Hagios is for that holiness of the Lord. It represents the sanctuary. It means to be morally pure, to be blameless, to be saints. How many saints do we have here today? Can I see your hand? Mercy me. All right, now I'm going to make an appeal to you. I'm going to appeal to you in the name of Jesus that you would accept Jesus Christ into your heart and life today. And I'm not saying this to be joking. I'm serious about this. Would you be willing, how many are willing today to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Thank you. By accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we become the saints of God. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> I know that there are some people that teach you're a saint because you've been voted in by some committee, right? And you've been elevated above all humanity. No, that's not true. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become saints of God. These are the people that Jesus is coming back to this earth to take to heaven, the saints of God. Not people that are perfect in every way, but the people that have been redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That makes them a saint. Holiness. Holy is the opposite of common or profane. God is different, and he is distinct from his creation. And no matter how people try to erect gods in their lives, there is nothing that can show what God really is like except God himself. His people must be distinct and separate from the other unbelievers and from the worldly attitudes and actions of the world, which, are, which characterizes them as unbelievers. And holiness, this encompasses our whole being. It encompasses everything of our human conduct. It also includes the law of God, which Paul himself said is holy and just and good in Romans chapter 7, verse 12. The law is holy. <clears throat> the commandments are a transcript of God's character. Did you ever think about that? That when you look at the commandments, we're reading what God is like. It's these great principles that God has laid down in his word through the commandments that God is showing, this is what I'm like. And so I'm asking you to be like me. Be ye holy as I am holy. Okay, so as we are following in the principles that God has laid down for us, we start to model the character of God to the world around us. Galatians chapter 5. I want you to turn with me, if you will, where Paul is talking here. In Galatians chapter 5. <coughs> Verse 
Galatians chapter 5, oops, in verse number 4. It says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, I think that Paul is trying to remind every one of his listeners, including modern day people like us. He is trying to remind us that if we think that we can be good enough to win heaven, we have fallen from the grace of God. I don't know about you, but I need God's grace in my life. And I need it every day, every moment. It is God's grace that justifies us as we accept Jesus Christ and the atoning sacrifice he made for us on the cross. Obedience is good if it is motivated by love for Jesus and what he has done for us. And Jesus himself talks about obedience in John chapter 14, verse 15, where he says, uh, um, if you love me, keep my commandments. But if we begin to think that as we become more obedient, that we're gaining favor from God for being so good, we have really lost the grace that God wanted us to have through Jesus Christ, his son. We are only good because Jesus is good. <laughs> Apart from Jesus, friends, our righteousness is like filthy rags. And the more we strive to be good without Jesus, the further we get from him. Does that make sense? Because in essence, we become our own God. We erect this false God in our life that the better I act, the more things I do that are correct, the more obedient I am without Jesus Christ, the better I am. You know, years ago, and I probably told you this before, I was visiting the head elder of a church that I pastored, and we were talking in his living room, me and his wife and him, and he was sitting in his easy chair, and he was telling me about different things of his life. And he says, you know, I got one more sin that I have to correct. And when I finish that, I'm going to be perfect. I thought, mercy. This guy doesn't know what holiness is, that's for sure. And he really doesn't understand what sin is and how it confuses us about what righteousness is. If we try on our own to be good, we're fighting a losing battle. It's like a dog chasing his tail. It doesn't work. The only way that you and I can be good and holy is because of Jesus. It isn't about us. It's all about Jesus Christ. We must show repentance to God and faith in Jesus and his sacrifice for us. And in this change of heart from God's, uh, God's grace, we are brought into harmony with God, uh, trying to save ourselves through law keeping. It doesn't work. But now, because we're obedient from love, motivated by what God has done for us, we then begin to take on the character of God and his holiness. You see, it doesn't work for us to try to be holy because what that makes us like is the old Pharisees of Jesus' day. You see that? It doesn't work. They tried everything they could to be holy apart from Jesus. It did not work. We have example after example in the scriptures where people try to do that apart from God and it does not work. The law shows us our sin, but it can't fix us. It can't cleanse us. It can't forgive us. It can't reinstate us to God. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can forgive us, can cleanse us. Only Jesus can make an atonement for us and restore us into our right relationship with the Father. Only Jesus can do that. Law keeping can never do it. And that's why Paul writes in Galatians that those who are trying to justify themselves or trying to make their life uh, uh, great and holy through the keeping of the law, they have really missed out on the grace of God. They have fallen from God's grace. I think it leads us to Jesus, the law does. And without the law, we would have no clue about what holiness is. We wouldn't understand what sin is. And God says, be holy even if I am holy. And we would wonder, well, what does that mean? What is holiness? What is righteousness? And without the law, we couldn't understand it. We couldn't know what sin is. And we'd go through our life doing all kinds of things that were an offense to God. And we wouldn't even recognize that we're a, a long ways from him. And that's why the law is there. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, the law acts like a schoolmaster to bring us to our Father and to Jesus Christ. It says in Galatians 3, 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. You look in Romans chapter 10, 
where Paul is talking here in Romans chapter 10 at verse number 4. It uses a word here that is, um, well, some people use this, this text here to show that the law has been done away with. That it's free for them to be able to live in the way they want without the law impinging upon their liberties and freedom. But in, in Romans chapter 10, at verse number 4, uh, Paul uses the word teleos. Oh, I'm in Corinthians. And in the Greek word um, for free, um, the end, in, in verse 4, I was in 1 Corinthians. It didn't match, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. <laughs> In Romans chapter 10 verse 4 it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. It, this word end is teleos. It means the ultimate or prophetic purpose of the law is to lead us to Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the law. Some people take that to read that, well, the law has come to an end. It's no longer effective anymore. We don't have to worry about it. It doesn't stand over top of us. It doesn't control us. We're at liberty and freedom. Well, we are at liberty and freedom through Jesus Christ by keeping the law. Because in keeping the law, we're not lawbreakers. You see, it's the people who are lawbreakers that are not free. And by not keeping the law and throwing it away, people become lawbreakers. We wouldn't have any idea that we're guilty before God if it wasn't for God's holiness in his law telling us what life is like. Uh, there are many people that think the law has been done away with. They want salvation, but they don't want to realize that their lost condition without the law. And because the law shows us our sins, consequently, they are married to the church and not to Jesus like the Pharisees of old. Does that make sense to you? We can throw the law out. We want salvation. We want all that heaven has to offer. We want to go to heaven with Jesus, but I don't want to be obedient to him, and I don't want him to impinge upon my life. I don't want him to tell me what to do. I want no restrictions in my life. I want to be free. And so I throw the law out, and it is the law that tells me I need Jesus. It is the law that shows me my guilt and my sin and how far I am from Christ. And to throw out the law and to only want salvation makes us just like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They were married to the church. They did everything they could in tithing and all kinds of laws and restrictions that they put on themselves and the people. And they did not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And they were bound up in their behavior. And they were not free. You want to be free? It only comes through Jesus. That's where freedom is at. If we live by Jesus... We will also love him, and we will love and obey his law. I believe that's what God wants for every one of us. It is the Holy Spirit that brings sanctification into our life. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 15, verse 16. It is the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us, and he will lead us into truth. And when we're confronted by the great principles of righteousness found in the law, we will be convicted of sin and our character will be formed by obedience to the law, and it will be holy like God's. Yeah, that's what God expects of us, to follow him in this law that he's given us so that our character will be changed. Yeah. We won't be perfect. <laughs> now, there are people I know sitting in this church today that think, you know, if I, if I just do this, if I just keep the Sabbath and I pay my tithe and I do this and I do that, and you've got this whole list of things that you think are going to make you righteous. Forget it. Those of you that are trying to be perfect through keeping of obedience and law have fallen from God's grace. You can no more be righteous and holy and a law keeper and obedient apart from Jesus any more than the Pharisees were. We are never going to be perfect until Jesus comes back to this earth and changes us from the corruptible to the incorruptible. Changes us from this person that has been a sinner all their life to a person who will live a righteous life in heaven. But that doesn't mean we don't strive for that. That's an ideal that God puts before every one of us. The devil will tempt us, tempt us, but by God's grace, we'll constantly fight against those temptations. 
And when men like Isaiah and Moses and Job and Daniel, the men of God looked at God's majesty. They saw his holiness in his law. They saw their own unworthiness and they con they, uh, how that contrasted with the purity and the holiness and perfection of God. And when the people of Israel worshiped Moloch, that pagan god, they committed sexual sins. They, they worshiped in the occult. They worshiped in the spirit world of all kinds of different spirits that they bowed down to. They disrespected their parents. They ate all kinds of unclean animals. They did all of those things that defiled them and made them morally unfit to worship the true living God of heaven. But God separates us from the world so that we'll be wholly his. We're to imitate his holiness by following his principles that he has laid down in his word. And he says to you and to me today, be ye holy because he's holy.